what you see here is isolated, quote unquote, virus particles of the COVID-19. Um, I've come to realize through listening to lectures and uh, virology that the scientists will interchangeably use the word virus and particle. But even though we can't, we, you know, we have electron microscopes, but we can't see the ones that are extremely tiny. So we have to work with what we have, which is these particles, you know, we'll extract like the nucleic acid. And I want you to listen uh, to Bart K talk about this because he actually responds to one of these doctors that is going with this theory that maybe we don't know what viruses are and that, you know, this idea that we don't even know what, you know, how these uh, things are contagious. And I don't know if this doctor, I haven't listened to much on this doctor, if he's saying that viruses aren't real or what have you. But just take a listen to what Bart K says. I was really excited to hear this. And then we'll talk more about this. And the RT part refers to that we're using it to, to amplify RNA rather than DNA. If we were using it to amplify DNA, it would just be called PCR. Okay. Now, I'll tell you some important things about this test. So the most important thing is it's not actually testing for the virus itself. It's testing for a sequence of RNA. Now, that sequence of RNA may be present in a virus, but it also may be present in other things. So I'll give you an example. And I think I mentioned this before. But let's say we had a person that we wanted to identify. Okay. So James, I'm going to use you this time. So we want, we want to be able to identify James out of a crowd. And we're going to send him to a Yankee Stadium to a baseball game. And, but we're not going to use, we're not going to look for James's face or any other part of his actual body. Instead, we're going to use uh, a surrogate marker just like they're using for this test. So we're going to put a, a cap on James's head. And now we're not going to use the typical navy blue Yankees hat because there's going to be a million people with that, right? So we got a, a unique Yankees hat with pinstripes on it. So it's white with blue pinstripes. And we're going to have him put that hat on and then go into the stadium and disperse amongst the crowd. And then we have a team of 10 people that we're going to send out into the stadium looking for that hat. Okay, so we do this procedure. And lo and behold, what happens is we actually find six of these hats. Okay, so six out of the 10 people find someone wearing this hat. So we go and identify if any of those people are James. And it actually turns out that none of them are James because James doesn't like wearing hats. So once he got in the stadium, he gave his hat to, uh, to some kid who would have liked it. And that was one of the six people that we found. So you see that when you, when you um, are looking for something that's not exactly the thing you're looking for, but it's something that's associated with that thing, you have to really understand the relationship between what you're looking for and that thing. Yeah, okay, so Andrew is now talking about the problems with using a proxy marker for something without first having the absolute for want of a better word, proof or evidence that the source, the thing that is supposedly the source of this RNA is there. In other words, before we can say this thing's definitely a virus, we need to be able to see this virus. We need to get in there with an electron microscope and look at the shape of the jolly thing and say, there it is. Yep, it's a virus. That's what it looks like. That's what shape it is. Okay. Still fair commentary at this point, although probably overly verbose, Andrew, about all of this, but basically what he's saying is the diagnostic test for COVID-19, which is a disease, by the way, not a virus, is a test for some RNA, which may or may not be associated with a particular virus, according to Andrew here. And the test is invalid, basically, is what he's saying. Okay, fine. It's his... It, that's that's his uh, that's his argument with regard to the diagnostic test. He's going to talk about projected false positives as high as eighty percent with this particular test. Okay, fine. There are real real problems with the diagnostic test that someone has the disease COVID nineteen. Um, that's fine. Okay, that that's as it is. That's useful information. That's good for people to know. Okay. So in other words, we had to ask James, James, will you, will you be comfortable wearing this hat the whole time? Right? And then we also have to know, did other people um, buy this hat or is this a one-of-a-kind hat? Right? So you can see it can be very misleading. We can get a lot of false results um, by using this type of method. So in order to mitigate that, and by the way, this concept was just drilled into us in medical school, that whenever you're evaluating a new test, that you need to compare it to the gold standard. And that's how you know if it's actually valid. So with this COVID-19 test, there has not been any gold standard test that this has been compared to. Right, so there's no gold standard to compare it to, so it's very difficult to say even what the false negatives are. And then he goes on to talk about some projections made by some people that say around 80% failure rate of this test to be accurate. I don't know where that comes from, if there is no gold standard or how that estimate could possibly have been made, but there you go. Because the uh, supposed COVID-19 virus has never been purified um, and visualized. So in other words, uh, has it not? Okay. Maybe it hadn't when, when Andrew made this made this video. It has now. Whoops. <laughs> oh dear. 
So all the conspiracy theorists, all the, oh, it's, the, the thing doesn't exist, it's not real, because Andrew Kaufman said so. They have got in there with a scanning electron microscope now, boys and girls, and they have looked at it and they have seen its morphology. In other words, they know what shape it is. It's a real thing. They've seen it. It's there. The COVID, the, the, the virus that causes COVID-19 illness is now an identified thing. It's a pathogen. It's a virus. There we go. It's real. Okay, shall we move on? If we were able to take people who are ill with... So, Bart is very bright. I look to him for a lot of my nutritional science information. And I'm not trying to really go up against him. I'm, you know, I'm not uh, educated in all of these fields. So, you know, take it with a grain of salt or whatever. But I'm just, I'm looking into this and I'm seeing an issue because he just stated that there are issues with, um, you know, when we're using particles and we haven't isolated the entire virus, okay? And then he goes on in his next statements to say that it's a wrap. That's exactly what we've done. We've isolated the virus now. So I'm seeing a little bit of cognitive dissonance, maybe. Maybe that's ego. I'm not sure. It's the same thing I see with a lot of educated people who, you know, once they come into conflict with one of these ideas, they just shut down and move on. Now I want to read this. Ideal viral conditions. Isolating a virus requires collecting specimens from patients and culturing or growing any viruses that occur in the samples. These viruses or obligate intracellular parasites, which means that they can only replicate and multiply in the cells. To isolate a particular virus, researchers need to provide it with an opportunity to infect live mammalian cells in tiny flasks or on tissue culture plates. Viruses adapt to their host and evolve to survive and replicate efficiently within their particular environment. A new virus such as SARS or COVID emerges it isn't obvious what particular environment the virus has adapted to, so it can be hard to grow it successfully in the lab. We can use tricks to draw out a virus. Sometimes the tricks work and sometimes they don't. In this case, the researcher tried a method and the team had previously used while working on the coronavirus that causes Middle Eastern Respiratory Disease so uh, Syndrome. So um, what they do, they have to grow it in a lab setting and then they look at what they've grown. And there can be all sorts of problems with this. And this actually brings in the terrain theory and gives a lot of credence to that. And I'll explain why. We can use tricks to draw out the virus. Sometimes they work. Okay. Um, culturing a virus in, on immunodeficient cells that would allow the virus to multiply unchecked. And it worked. Now, that's important. That's really, really important because they had to use these specific cells. And I've talked about this before, how... Not all cells are susceptible. They use, uh, when they're making vaccines, they like to use, like, um, they like to grow them on organs. And um, they, when they use the eggs, they have to be fertilized. So the embryo, these have to be very susceptible cells is uh, basically what it is. So they literally had to use immunodeficient cells to get this virus to grow. This is important. This is something that everyone should know. This should also be on the news that... Since we don't really understand the contagious aspect of really any virus, we should be letting people know at least that, you know, even to study these in a lab setting, we have to use very sick, very sick cells to grow them on. And so, and I've also talked about this, that if, you know, we can grow them, that, that lends some credence to the fact that they can invade. That does mean, you know, they're contagious. I think that's what I believe because how, you know, they have to invade these cells to grow. Unless you're going to say that these cells are just making these viruses. And they also acknowledge that there are so many other viruses present. So they have to, again, identify it because they, for all they know, they could have grown a random virus that was already there. Since specimens from patients are also likely to contain other viruses, it is critical to determine if a virus growing in the culture is really the target coronavirus. Researchers confirm the source of infection by extracting genetic material, extracting genetic material from the virus particle in the culture, 
and sequencing its genome. And so they sequence it, and then they look in their database where they have listed and named all of these viruses. They compare the sequence to known coronavirus sequences to identify it precisely. Once a culture is confirmed, researchers can make copies to share with colleagues. All this work must be done in secure, high-contaminant laboratories that mitigate the risk of accidental virus release into the environment and also protect scientists from accidental exposure. So, yeah, a lot of things covered here. But again, we're working with particles. And they go on to say the more versions of the virus that can be, quote-unquote, isolated, the better. And that's the thing. Um, that does help. That does help. So if you've got a particle and you've got sick patients where you got that culture from and you grow it and you, you keep looking at it again and again and again, you can match it up and, you know, all of these different areas. I guess it does lend some credence to the fact that this is actually what we're looking at. But again, we have not, you know, unless these viruses are larger, like, say, mumps, they're not going to be seen under the electron microscope. That's why we're looking at particles. That's why we're doing all of this. That's why they do all of these versions. That's why they have the database. That's why they, you know. So that's all I'm really saying here. So could I be wrong? Of course I could be, you know, the way they're doing this absolutely could be 100% correct. You know, all of these other theories could be wrong. What I'm saying is that there is room for debate because of this. Okay, so that's all I'm saying. I do feel like to a certain extent the public is purposefully being deceived because in my mind this should be headline news that to even culture this particular virus or virus particle or whatever, it has to be done in immunocompromised cells, meaning you know, you have to be pretty sick to even get it, maybe, or, you know, to fall desperately ill to this, you know. So, um, that's, that's pretty important, you know, especially, especially given the fact that scientists willingly acknowledge that we don't really understand the person-to-person -person contagious aspect. So, yeah, I got cut off there, sorry. Um, yeah, that's all I really wanted to say, that, uh... A lot of these very educated scientists don't want to acknowledge the real issue we have here and why there is room for debate. That's all I'm really saying. I don't know one thing or another. I just put out a video that I think my whole town got this like a month or so ago. So y'all have a good day.